Okay, okay. So let's let's start with today's seminar series. So welcome everybody that is connected right now. As you know, we have monthly seminars uh, with invited speakers from working in space weather. Before starting, as always, I would like to remind you that the webinars are recorded and later posted in the UNOSA YouTube channel. Uh, any comment or question you have during the talk, please post it in the chat and later we will re uh, read it after the presentation. In this opportunity, we have invited Dr. Mijo Javier. She's a PhD student, a PhD, sorry, no student, <laughs> PhD in plasma physics <laughs> from, from Kyoto University in Japan, where she worked on magnetic reconnection from 2011 to 2013. She had a postdoc uh, fellowship at Paris of um, at the Paris Observatory Lesia in France, working on solar flares. From 2013 to 2015, she was a lecturer in Dundee University in the UK, working on solar flares and on coronal mass ejections. Since 2015, she is an associate astronomer at the Institut d'Astrophysique Spatiale. I hope I read it okay. Continuing research, teaching, and involvement with the Solar Orbiter mission as a deputy uh, project scientist for the SPICE instrument and co I for the EUI instrument. Since October 2022, so very recently, she is a second element at ESA East Tech as a solar physics to work on the coordination between missions and ground based telescopes and the solar uh, orbiter. So today's talk, uh, today Mijo's talk is entitled Origins of Space Weather Phenomena Design, Additional Constraint for Multi-Spacecraft Observation at the Solar Orbiter Mission. So thank you very much for being here, Mijo. And I'll let you, thank you. with your presentation. Great, thank you so much for having me. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation. Um, I really do hope that that's going to be okay with the PDF version of the talk. Um, there were a few animations I wanted to show, but I, th I think it's going to work um, this way anyways. Um, so I wanted to talk about several things. Um, I didn't check whether, okay. So what is meant here by um, space weather? There, there are a lot of things that we can talk um, when we talk about space weather. Um, there are, there are things that I'm going to list. Uh, I'm not going to be able to cover everything within the time that, that, that I have. Um, but when we talk about space weather, I guess the, the, the thing that we think about is how is the sun evolving and how does the sun um, evolution impact the planets of the solar, uh, the solar system? And of course, there's the radiation that comes from the sun, uh, especially uh, what we like to look at with uh, space observatories, um, UV and extreme ultraviolet light, extra radiation that comes from uh, very energetic events such as flares that we'll, I will talk a, a lot about, about this. Um, and we also have um, uh, things such as energetic particles. Um, so they're not just from solar sources. When we talk about space weather in general, they can come from outside of the solar system, uh, such as galactic cosmic rays, sometimes even outside of the, ga the galaxy itself. Uh, but in the following, I will, I will touch upon um, uh, solar sources of, of, uh, of energy particles. And um, there are also other events, such as coronal mass ejections that are large, blast of, of particles and magnetic field that come from the sun and they can travel quite far away in the solar system. That's an example of a video that is not working because of the PDF version, but um, it's a, a, a nice um, a video if you have the occasion to see it. Uh, it spans over a few weeks, I think. It's accelerated at least over a few days and you can see a lot of CMEs during the 1998 um, uh, May months. Uh, or you can see a lot of CMEs being ejected from, from the sun. Um, all the sources of space weather can also be due to uh, solar wind, and especially the fast streams that catch up with um, slow winds. As you can see here in this, um, uh, this, is, this was also a, a video, but you, we can see here with the colors. What is represented here in red is a coronal mass ejection front. Uh, but in blue, you can see the, the front of a very fast solar wind that is catching up with the slow solar winds. And the interaction between both can create shocks and therefore can also create some geomagnetic events um, at planets. Um, and there are also other things that we consider within the, the realm of space weather um, that have to do with the planet's 
magnetospheres um, and uh, for, for those who have one and also atmospheres, but um, I'm, I'm not gonna talk too much about that really. Um, so of course, with all these things, um, so there was two questions in one. <laughs> uh, you can't see it, so I'm just gonna pass it uh, very quickly. But the question was, what is the source of, of space weather? And what I wanted to point out is like, the is is not really um, a good question, it's more what are the sources of space weather? Because there are a lot of different sources. And the first one that comes to mind, um, I talked about UV, extreme UV, X-ray radiations, particles, uh, and one of the sources of that are active regions. And so active regions, um, they, I guess they were probably the, maybe not, not necessarily the most studied, but the, the longest uh, study probably, uh, just because of the apparition of sunspots on the, on the surface of the sun. And we have recordings of um, uh, Galileo already at the time uh, looking at the evolution of sunspots on the surface of the sun. Um, and so uh, sunspots, uh, anything that has to do with the evolution of sunspots, but um, also everything that has to do with the atmosphere counterpart of, of these sunspots um, can lead to solar flares, can lead to coronal mass ejections. And these in, in, um, in time get to um, planets of the solar system or bodies of the solar system can create uh, storms of different kinds, geomagnetic storms, solar radiation storms, uh, radio blackouts as well. And then we also um, so I talked about active regions being uh, one of the sources of coronal mass ejections. Uh, but coronal mass ejections can also come from other places that are not related with active regions. Um, so in, um, I'm just gonna plug my other computer, I'm always gonna shut the PDF down. Um, this was also a video that I wanted to show, but maybe you can already see it with the, the dark, uh, so I hope you can see my mouse, but you can see um, a, a dark filament on, on, on the sun in this three or four um, image. And what I want to show here is a really long filament structure that will eventually erupt. And when you look at the counterparts in terms of uh, magnetic fields, or if you look at uh, sunspots, they are numb. Um, so there's no counterparts really in the lower altitudes of the, uh, the sun's atmosphere. And we tend to coin these um, events stealth CMEs. So they're kind of um, stealth, they, they, we don't really, you know, we, we don't really see any counter, but there's no flaring activity necessarily. And that being said, a significant fraction of those CMEs that will eventually lead to geomagnetic, um, uh, ge geomagnetic storms on Earth, for example, are not that well predicted. And it's quite important to know because these are also a large source of space weather. I talked earlier as an introduction that we also have um, fast streams uh, that lead to interaction regions with the slow solar wind. And the origin, um, they, 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 they might be you know, more or less um, a few, but generally they come from regions of fast solar wind um, that is emanating from the sun. And these are seen uh, as coronal holes. So we have one example here with the um, SDO AIA 193 angstrom, where we see a really nice uh, coronal hole in the shape of um, I think for Japanese people, the ship of Hokkaido, which is the, the northern part, uh, northern island. Um, and it's a really, really nice coronal hole that is um, at the equator. Uh, we see some also at the northern and southern poles. And what happens when we have this fast stream of, of, um, of solar wind, as you can see here in the uh, Belgian Davis paper um, uh, figure that I've, I've taken from, from, from the papers, uh, is that we have this fast stream that is coming and, and uh, entering in the slow wind and that creates a zone of compression that can lead to shocks and uh, particle accelerations. That's what um, I've put here as a diagram, uh, energy particles that are forming that also can lead to solar radiation storms um, as well as geomagnetic storms. Um, and so now that we have seen the, these origins, we haven't really seen the mechanisms. So the question to be asked is what are the mechanisms at the origin of, of these events? And because of lack of time, because there are a lot of things I want to cover, I will mostly focus on, on flares, uh, CMEs and, and SAPs. So in terms of, let, let's start with, with flares. Um, in terms of the origin uh, as of active regions, we now understand a bit more how active region forms and, and there's a certain consensus on, on the fact that uh, in general active regions 
come from the emergence of magnetic flux from deeper down in the convection zone, and they tend to um, create this uh, uh, toroidal magnetic flux that will eventually become buoyant and emerge um, uh, at the photospheric level. Uh, but not only is the uh, the formation of the active region important, it, its evolution is also quite important. So what I have put here on the right side of the of the slide is an active region that is seen at different times. So you can see on the 3rd of August, 25th of September and 18th of November. And what we see is that active regions can actually be sustained for quite a long time, even though they're not necessarily associated with a really nice uh, sunspot. So sunspot can uh, disperse. Uh, we have flux constellation as well. And what is important is that we think that all these ingredients in the evolution of an active region are important in creating conditions for a flare. So I've listed uh, them here, the, the fact that we have sheared coronal loops, we have flux dispersal, a decrease in the magnetic field, flux cancellation, etc. And these are the ingredients that are put in uh, certain scenarios. I will talk about it a bit more later. But before that, I want to um, also point the fact that we have different types of flares. We have um, um, eruptive and confined flares. So the, the, the way we separate them is the fact that for eruptive flares, we really have something global. So an eruption, so flare that will lead to ejection or uh, injection of, of material in, in the heliosphere, the inner heliosphere. And in terms of the sun, that creates a really large disturbance that we can see here, for example, in this base difference image. Um, even though if you look just at the X-ray flux, there's almost no, no change at all. If you look now at the, um, uh, at the observation in the corona um, and at chromospheric levels, uh, flares generally, whether they're eruptive or confined, they tend to have similar aspects. So such as, for example, the presence of flare ribbons, um, especially at chromospheric levels, sometimes in what we call white light flare, we also have uh, illumination at the photospheric level. Um, and we also have the, uh, the, the formation of flare loops. So the um, uh, AIA 171 pictures that you see here is supposed to be um, a video where you see these hot loops that are created and, and tend to um, to grow. Uh, what we think is happening is that you actually have um, several formation of flare loops, one on top of each other that creates kind of this growing aspect um, of, uh, of flare loops. So these are ingredients that we put in uh, in what we call flare in general, an archetypical flare. And we also have recurrent observations of certain structures we call that we call flux ropes um, that we think are um, at the heart of solar eruptions. So we have different types of, of observations. We have either um, direct magnetic field observations, mostly at the photospheric level, but with extrapolations, we know that is nonlinear phosphor fields um, are related to twisted structures. Um, we have what we call sigmoids. Um, so this is a case here with the Hinode XRT uh, image. And um, as I'm going to show just after, we also have um, simulations that generally at the heart of them, at the heart of having an RT flare meets uh, a flock rope. And we also have, of course, filaments and, and, and prominences as well. So that over the years, that led to um, building a, a, a schematic of, of what flares uh, are, really. And um, those cartoons, I would say, or those um, analytical model uh, would put little by little more ingredients um, as we had more observations. So, for example, um, we, we know that the reconfiguration of the magnetic field leads to the formation of flare loops that we can see here in, in red on the Shibata et al's uh, um, model. Um, and we also have the, the acceleration of particles um, and that leads to hard X-ray sources. Um, we also have radio waves that can um, uh, that can be generated by uh, uh, electron beams. So there are a lot of different observations that little by little constrain the uh, uh, the, uh, the model. And what we we did with um, uh, with colleagues of mine and and, and beyond, us, of course, there are several groups that did that. Again, the um, the left hand side 
image that you see was supposed to be an animation of a 3D numerical MHD model that represents the formation from the moment we have um, a shearing at a photospheric level of a formation of a, uh, a seed, I would say, of a flux robe. And this flux robe, little by little, uh, tends to grow and at some point becomes unsta unstable. Uh, there was some study made by um, my colleague uh, Guillaume Olenier et al. Um, and that led to what we call a torus unstable flux rope, and that eventually leads to an eruption. And this um, flux rope eruption actually leads to more reconnection underneath um, and, and grows the flux rope with a, a twisted envelope. So this is one scenario. There are others, and I would say that the main other uh, scenario that is not the torus unstable flux rope is the fact that we have a breakout reconnection above a flux rope. So the flux rope is, itself is kind of stable because we have um, tension from the magnetic field above this flux rope and eventually because of reconnection above we release the flux rope that is then uh, allowed to, um, to, to erect. So we've seen what are the, the physical mechanisms that can lead to um, uh, flux rope eruptions, and that led us to develop a 3D model of a, um, a flux rope uh, and an eruptive flare um, that had ingredients that were not necessarily depicted in the 2D model, such as, for example, the J-shaped ribbon, the fact that we have uh, MHD currents, that we can see them in observations, especially with um, HMI data, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I'm, I'm only skimming um, on the surface of, of all this, but it's just to give you an idea of, of where we are at um, at the moment. I've talked about flares. Um, so flares, as I said, uh, they can be seen in extreme UV, in X-rays, um, and we also have particles that are accelerated. I, I, I touched upon that a little bit just before, I, and I will delve into this a little bit more. So what we see in situ um, in, in space or even uh, in ground on the ground uh, on Earth is the arrival of, of those particles when the orientation of their propagation path is in the right way. And what has been kind of intriguing was the fact that there are different detections of um, SCP, so solar energy particle events, um, mostly what we call gradual SCP events um, that you can see here on the left, where the, the, the arrival is, is kind of, well, the arrival itself is sudden, but then you've got this gradual phase. Um, and it's by contrast with impulsive events, where you see a really impulsive arrival of, of SCPs. And so what people have thought was um, maybe there are two different mechanisms that can explain the arrival of, of and the detection of these particles. The fact that for uh, scenario A, so what we see on the left is the fact that when we have a shock um, that is driven by a coronal mass ejection, this shock can, because of its extension, can actually accelerate particles at, in different paths uh, of the Parker spiral. And therefore, the detection of these events is, is really large. On the contrary, whenever we have an impulsive STP, it's probably that the acceleration is made lower in, in, the, in the atmosphere and it's more at the flare side to more than at the, uh, the CNE side. And um, what I want to point out here is that the problem with the CMEs, um, uh, the CME scenario is that we have found a huge variations in intensities of associated SCPs, uh, at least at 1AU, and it's kind of hard to really link the, um, uh, I would say, the characteristics of, of, of CMEs with the characteristics of SCP events that, that we see. Um, for um, impulsive events that are uh, accelerated through the flare, um, there is also the fact that not everything is understood because in certain cases we see impulsive events, but we see impulsive events also at different locations. So we need to connect um, the flare site to a, a quite varied range longitudinally of detections. And so what have been proposed is that actually, even though uh, particles can be accelerated lower in the in the sun's atmosphere, we can still have um, a, a quite long, large longitudinal range of injection due to the fact that this expanding flux rope can actually reconnect with nearby uh, feed lines, open feed lines that can then create a path for um, these particles to propagate in the, the heliosphere. 
Um, and I just want to point, um, there, there are a lot of, uh, um, again, this is really not exhaustive, I, so don't quote me just on, on what I'm presenting, um, but I found this study quite interesting, led by uh, Columba Cossetal, uh, where they, they found, um, uh, and in the title of, of my talk was, what are the constraints from multi-spacecraft observations? And this is a really nice example where um, there was a, an SCP widespread events that was detected by different spacecraft, uh, so we had a Parker Solar Probe, we had, um, uh, I think this one also had Solar Beater from memory, so maybe I'm, I'm mistaken with another event, and, and also one AU and Stereo A. And so what the, the authors did was um, they tried to model the shock of the CME and looked also at the connectivity of all these spacecraft on the sun, so with a connectivity tool, in order to understand how the CME is indeed um, uh, injecting particles at different paths uh, on the Parker spiral. And I think now we're really all at this age of, you know, some people say that it's the golden age in a way of having multi spacecraft observations at different um, locations in the inner helosphere where we can really constrain what is the longitudinal extension of these particle injections and whether there's actually a difference between. Um, lower in the chromosphere, uh, so impulsive events or gradual events, or whether it's kind of, you know, both can be explained by the same scenario. Um, so I've talked about um, uh, SCPs, I talked about flares. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about CMEs, especially uh, higher in the corona, even in the inner heliosphere. I just want to point to the fact that even though we're making great advances in understanding um, flares, SCPs and we have models. There's still a few things that, at least for me, um, uh, you know, are, are big question marks. And for me, it's really the fact that we still, I feel, do not really understand what's the transport of energy. Um, so whether it's the energy that is transported by the bulk uh, of the plasma, so the heating process, um, whether it's the non-thermal parts uh, of uh, reconnection that creates this bunch of, of particles that, that we see. And there's this kind of gap between the macroscopic dynamics of magnetic fields that we see really well with, for example, um, uh, EUV imaging, and what we see uh, in terms of particles. And how to how to clear the gap for me is, uh, is kind of a, um, a difficult question to, to answer. Um, there's this really nice uh, set of papers by Ashwan de et al. Um, and I really like this graph that pre they presented where uh, we've got this, uh, you know, primary uh, energy dissipation when we have all these mechanisms that are supposed to 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 happen but it's really hard from an observational point of view to really pinpoint um at least whether we have um, an archetypical flare um, model that really says that much amounts goes into particle acceleration that amounts goes into heating or uh, semi uh, kinetics and i think we haven't really we haven't have we don't have a model because I think it can depend from one fire to another, um, but maybe there are some fundamental processes that still need to be understood. And we have some hints from laboratory plasma, um, and I want to mention this because it's a, a community that come uh, that I come from originally, and and people have been looking really at the, uh, what happened in terms of reconnection. Uh, when we have feedlines that are reconnecting and, and they're really trying to understand how much of energy is transferred to electrons, of ions. We've got also in the magnetospheric um, community some uh, hints with um, missions such as MMS. But can we really translate that into solar physics is, is still a big question. So um, there are still things to be understood on, on, on that side. Um, I will move now from the corona uh, into more the heliosphere by talking about CMEs. They, they are also big question marks for CMEs. Um, I would say mostly in terms of observational difficulties. So um, when we see CMEs in terms of um, white light events or even UV, EUV uh, events, it's quite kind of hard to really understand the morphology of, of these structures. Um, we know that generally they have a front that is uh, that is due to plasma that is piled up, especially with compression of, of the of the solar wind at, at the front. Um, we can derive some parameters such as the speed, the width, the locations, um, but it's quite difficult to constrain um, our views of it because of of the projection effects that we have. And I think. 
um, in, in the near future with, for example, the solar orbit emission um, and with the METIS instrument. I will talk more about the instruments and board emission, but I, I hope we'll really get especially as we're gearing towards the maximum of the solar cycle, we'll get more and more of these uh, triangulation um, uh, positions that will allow us to really probe the structure of, of scenes. One of my interests uh, is to look at in situ, uh, so the in situ counterpart of coronal mass elections, what we call interplanetary CMEs or ICMEs. And there are a lot of uh, different criteria that you can, you can use in order to define uh, what is a CME. Um, and that depends on the, really, most of the time, it just depends on what instrumentation you have. Uh, most of the time, it's great to have a magnetic field, of course, because the magnetic field is a really good indicator of, um, of whether or not you have a CME. And if you went to the last seminar by Sergio Dasso, I'm sure he talks extensively about, about that. But also having uh, some diagnostics about the plasma inside, will um, allow you to understand whether you have, for example, a, a low plasma beta, uh, a low beta, sorry, plasma, um, that generally is an indication of, of a nice magnetic cloud. Um, and you also can have detection of, of particles inside, such as uh, counter-streaming electron beams that allows you to understand whether the structure is still attached to the sun um, and so on and so forth. I'm just listing here the type of uh, criteria that we use. Um, and again, there is a, a lot of things to, to be said about interplanetary CMEs, but I just want to point out the kind of um, uh, the kind of studies that we can do from multi spacecraft observations. And one uh, one example, a few examples here, or the fact that you can see um, uh, the structure at the sun and then follow it in the interplanetary medium. And there was a, a nice paper some time ago by um, Nakwatsky and et al, where they looked at uh, one AU and Ulysses data to look at the expansion of the uh, of the magnetic field inside ICMEs. Um, that was so that's more like one AU and outer heliosphere. Uh, if I may say, I mean, it's up to Jupiter uh, orbit. And then we have also the inner heliosphere counterpart with um, uh, Good et al. and Wislow et al. where they looked at Messenger, Venus Express data, etc. And so you're able by that to look at um, either one case study where you look at its evolution from the sun all the way to certain distance of the sun, or you can also do a statistics by looking at, well, at this heliospheric distance, um, then you can see that the magnetic field behaves this way inside CMEs and then at this, that distance uh, in, in another way and create, um, as uh, the Winslow et al's paper, um, the uh, kind of a, a low of um, uh, evolution of certain characteristics, such as here, the magnetic field. So we did the same kind of study with, um, uh, with colleagues. Um, especially we looked at um, what we call a method that is called superposed epoch methods. Well, what we do is we look at the uh, start event, uh, the start of an event and then the end of an event, and we normalize all the events with the start and the end. As you can see here, we actually have three uh, defining times. The start of what we call the sheath, which is the compressed um, bit in front of the CME, and uh, the in blue, you've got the start and the end um, of the magnetic ejecta. And by normalizing all the events together, you can then uh, put them together and make an average of, uh, of the profiles that led us to have um, an, uh, a look at the average of, of ICMEs, in this case with a magnetic field. We did an extensive study on, uh, on their impacts on galactic cosmic rays seen, seen at Earth, which I will not talk about here. So we ex uh, extended this study with um, uh, Florian Rognon, uh, who published uh, his paper in 2020. And what we looked at was the difference between um, uh, high speed event and low speed events. And what we saw was the profile of the magnetic field, the, the top row that you can see here, um, is very different whether you have a high speed CME or low speed CME. And what we thought what, what that was happening was high speed CMEs even at 1 AU, do not have a relaxed profile, which means that they're still interacting with the surrounding solar wind, uh, while the slow moving ones have actually um, a more bell shape. I mean, not so much in, in this case here, uh, but they have um, a, a more relaxed magnetic field profile um, than, than the, the high speed ones. 
And we did the same kind of study by looking at messenger data and Venus Express data. We did a bit of a, a statistic as well. And that led us to actually see that this um, uh, relaxation that you can see here in terms of the, the peak of the, the, the magnetic field in the magnetic ejector actually uh, starts to relax. So it, it shifts and it becomes more symmetrical at 1AU, what you can see here at the bottom with the ACE data that you see at messenger. So what we're looking at is really this CME that is propagating in the inner heliosphere up to 1AU and its profile becoming more and more relaxed um, as time goes by. Um, and of course, this is uh, complemented by um, the possibility to do uh, models. And there are different, different groups that have done that. Um, uh, on our side, we also have done an, uh, uh, recently a 3D MHG model with uh, what's called the Pluto code, which is an, an open source code. And we started with a, um, a flux rope that is initiated with uh, a, an analytical shape. So Tita de Moulin, um, what's called a Tita de Moulin flux rope. Um, and we made it propagate up to one EU and we looked at um, its evolution, but also we tried to compare as if we were crossing it with synthetic um, uh, spacecraft so that we could compare directly with in-situ data. And what we found was uh, indeed the fast ones tend to really have um, a stronger magnetic field. Um, uh, as you can see here in the, the, the green the green bit here where my, my mouse is, uh, is where the sheath is. So the sheath tends to be much steeper, so much more compressed which is what we also see in the in-situ data. So we are at a time now where um, I would say in-situ data are becoming more, not necessarily interesting, but what I, uh, more constrained is the what I was searching for with multiple spacecraft, but we're still, you know, don't have that much uh, occurrences. And then we can add numerical simulations in order to really understand what's going on um, uh, from an in in-situ perspective. Um, and so now we are at a time where we have new missions. We have Parker Solar Probe that departed in 2018. We have Solar Orbiter that left Earth two years ago. And we are at a moment where we can use all these um, the spacecraft. We also have Bifi Colombo, which is a planetary mission, but spend, spends quite some time in its crew space uh, orbiting around the sun and collecting data from the solar wind. And I think that's kind of interesting to use all these spacecraft now in order to understand a bit more these space weather origins. So whether it's the particles, whether it's the, the flaring activity, understanding um, where the flares are occurring, how 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 we can better constrain with the instrument, inter, instrumentation that we have, um, et cetera. So in the last part of my talk, um, I would like to present, this is still an early, uh, I mean, still, an early version, I would say, of, of what we have at the moment um, of a really nice eruption that was seen by Solar Orbiter, but also other spacecraft. And I'm only going to talk about the coronal part just due to lack of time, um, but it's a really nice event which has shown also a widespread SAP event that, as well as a really nice coronal mass ejection. But before that, I would like to thank um, uh, a big team. A lot of people are involved because of the nature of this event, the fact that we have seen it with a lot of different instruments, but not only on Solar Orbiter, but also uh, Stereo A, 1AU, ground based obs observations as well. Um, so I would like to thank all, all these people who have contributed so far. Um, because I, I know not everyone knows about the Solar Orbiter mission, I just wanted to, um, to give a, a little intro as well. Um, so the, the mission departed, as I said, in, in 2020, and its aim is to end up with a quite, um, uh, so a highly elliptical orbit, but also um, uh, an angle in terms of uh, getting out of the ecliptic plane, and for the first time, image the poles uh, of the sun. And um, we've got a, a really nice um, set of, of instruments. So right now, in this, um, in this, uh, um, slide I'm presenting the institute payload. We have um, waves so with the uh, RPW instrument. We have the magnetic field with MAG. Uh, we also have uh, the solar wind analyzer, which looks at the electrons, the particles, the protons, um, hydrogen, uh, sorry, protons as well, uh, helium, etc. And we also have the energetic, energetic particle detector, EPD, with a, um, a sub, sub instruments as well, looking at uh, high energy electrons and protons as well. 
Um, I hope I didn't forget any. And then we also have the remote sensing payload um, with all the telescopes such as the uh, EUV imager. We've got um, imaging and X-ray spectrometers. We have a chronograph. Uh, we're monitoring the magnetic field with fee, and we also have a heliospheric imagers. So we have quite a comprehensive set of, of instruments. Um, and it's uh, it's quite complementary, I would say, to solar to other solar observatories. Uh, as you can see here in this um, uh, this very colorful that diagram, uh, is the, the the path that it's it's going to take over uh, over a few years, and because of the location of solar orbiter, it makes it quite of an interesting um, set of observations because then we can use Earth's observation along uh, with solar orbiter, either you know, to complement the observations that we have because we have different perspectives, or uh, in order to catch things that arrive first at solar orbiter than, than at the Earth. And I'm going to show uh, a few examples of, of that. Um, just one thing to remember for people who are not used to, to to this mission that is very different to the to the other type of missions that we have. So it is nothing like one EU missions such as wind or ACE where we constantly receive in situ uh, data and it's nothing like SDO either in the sense that we are not constantly monitoring the sun um, and, and that has to be uh, so that this is due to the fact that we've got a quite complex orbit we don't have um, always the telemetry that we want and we need to also observe quite uh, well we need to um, dedicate a bit of brain power quite uh, far in advance in order to decide what kind of target we want to have before the observations are actually made. So it's very different to just observing the sun and then something happens and then we know later. It's more um, trying to understand how the sun is going to behave and try to catch what we want to do uh, and try to think about that months in advance. Um, so um, if you want to get involved, there, there are different ways to do that. Um, I would say that if you have a, um, a science um, idea in mind, so whether it's, for example, using spectroscopy uh, with the SPICE instrument or whether it's um, you want to have high cadence, we've got a, the EUI imager um, can do two seconds, five seconds, of course, short bursts because we're, we don't have that much um, uh, you know, storage room, I would say, on board and telemetry as well. Um, but you can always come up with some plan and contact the instrument teams and say, this is what I would like to observe. Can you can you is that something that is possible? So I would say really, really talk with the instrument teams um, if you have some ideas on what kind of science targets you would you would want to have. Um, this is an example of where we are at at the moment. Um, this is the LTP stands for long term planning. So we plan way in advance the observation, the observations that will happen on, on board, but we tend to plan them when it's quite nice to see something. So uh, we avoid when we're behind the sun. We do synoptic programs, but we, we avoid having high um, uh, data storage campaign, I would say, because we, we want to have a downlink that is sufficient enough for us to get the, the data uh, rapidly. Um, and we also want to have the uh, observations with something that we can collaborate with, I would say, with um, as instruments, as assets. So, for example, in, in uh, the, the orange window here, we can see the sun uh, in quadrature with the Earth that is represented in, in blue. Uh, so of course, it's the yellow ball that you see at, at the at the, the middle, um, and you can see that. Uh, so we're starting from the first. Uh, so sorry, the square, the black square, almost at two AU, and we are coming back towards the Earth, and that's what's happening. That what has been happening since the end of June of this year, all the way up to December, and at the moment, I think we are. Uh, we just passed the perihelion window and we're entering soon the blue window that we see here. So we're getting closer to the Earth, but it's becoming kind of less interesting in the sense that now we have also Earth observations. Um, and we have, uh, just to finish, we have three times 10 days of observation windows uh, every six months, I would say. Um, so another thing to keep in mind is that if you want to have more information, uh, there is a wiki page. I've put the, uh, the I've put the link, but um, I don't know whether these slides will be shared, but I can I can share it with you. Where you have all the information, and especially if you are interested in coordinating with other other missions such as um, you know Aris and Hino Day, 
Um, if you want to observe on grounds, we have at the moment a campaign with a lot of ground-based instruments such as uh, DICIST, uh, but also in the Canary Islands, ALMA, VLA, etc. Uh, so it's kind of interesting to see what, what's going on and we hope to populate these pages a bit more in the future. Um, and if you want to access the data, the data are made available on the Solar Orbiter Archive. So I'm sure if you tap on Google Solar Orbiter Archive, this page will come up. Um, and the instrument teams put their uh, the data. Normally, there's a, a period of three months where we, we do the calibration um, of the, the data before putting them, so before the data releases. Uh, the only thing to keep in mind is that um, the, the, the latency can change because of the downlink. So the time it gets, uh, it, the time it takes for us to get the, the data uh, from onboard to the grounds. Um, so they are sometimes difficulties with it. Calibration is not always uh, easy. So if there are sets of uh, specific observations that you would like, I would say, again, get close to the instrument team and ask them questions. I think that's the best thing to do. I don't have that much time. I, I'll i try to go through uh, just one example. Um, I won't go through all the details, but I just want to show an example of what can be done with um, different instruments. This is uh, the last campaign, so the first um, uh, remote sensing campaign that was done in the first half, so the first uh, nomination, nominal mission phase that happened in March and April of this year. And there were a lot of different science targets. So whether it was looking at the slowing uh, and connecting it to the spacecraft, whether well, it was looking at um, the, uh, the the sources of solar winds, fast solar winds with polar coronal holes, nano flares, etc. And the one that I'm going to present is this uh, this window, so the blue one here, so the end of the red and the beginning of the blue, where we did an active region, the AOR that you see here, the active region tracking. And during that time, uh, this is the position of the spacecraft. So we have Earth uh, in green, Solar Orbiter in blue, and we also have other spacecraft such as Baby Colombo and Serial A. And um, the science goal at the time was to really look at, an, at the evolution of an active region. And we had a really nice set of active regions here, um, 9, 12, 9, 7, 5, and 12, 9, 7, 6. We decided to point uh, with our uh, smaller field of view uh, instruments at the leading polarity because it looked quite promising in terms of evolution. And we we're quite lucky, and again, this is where I would have liked to have my uh, non PDF version to show you the, the really nice CME that, that we saw. It was a really nice CME with Lasco C2, and we um, co started collecting all the data. So we have this. Nice filament that we see in the um, SDO AIA uh, 304 channel. Um, and we saw it erupting in the AIA field of view. Again, uh, this is a video that I cannot show. And that led to an M class flare that was recorded by GHOST. So that's the first one here, that this really nice long duration event followed by, followed by an impulsive event. Um, and it was also seen by all the instruments on Solar Orbiter. So again, um, uh, it's something that, I mean, there is a paper in preparation, so we'll link uh, the, the video in, in this paper if you're interested in the near future. But this is a really nice uh, set of observations taken by the EUY, so the EUV Imager Onboard Solar Orbiter, at really high cadence. Uh, so that was 10 second cadence and really nice high resolution. And what we saw was um, the, so you have to believe me because um, I'm, I'm not showing the video here, uh, but the overlying arcades that you can see over the the, the filament that is in, in dark. So it's a bit of a lag with, with my uh, with my mouse, but I hope you can see this kind of dark shape, S shape, um, underneath these really bright overlying arcades. And what we saw was the overlying arcades were actually moving out. Um, there was an apparent motion that we didn't know whether it was an actual motion or whether that was just a heating and cooling process um, that we had. And so what we tried to do was we did a, a stack plot um, of so what you can see here in the, the white window where we looked at um, the intensity evolution of these loops and we saw indeed that these uh, loops were, were moving, at least there was a, an apparent motion that was quite coherent. And we saw that as well with um, uh, SPICE, uh, this SPICE instrument. So again, these are, are um, not showing as, as videos, but in the NEON 8 uh, intensity map that you can see, um, I hope you can detect uh, with my the mouse, I'm overlying, I'm passing over with my mouse, but you can see these, um, uh, these 
within us coronal loops. We could see them also in other lines, such as um, oxygen-6. And what we thought was um, good was to look at them uh, in the stat plot, the, the same way we did with the EUV imaging um, in time. And what we saw was actually we can see the same motion so the same um, apparent motion of, of the overlying eye kits. And that led us to say, well, if we see them in different lines and they're quite coherent from one line that gives one temperature to another one, it means that the, um, the loops themselves are multi-thermal and they're moving all together in one go. It's not just a, a cooling and, 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 and uh, heating process, although we're checking with the cooling and heating process time. Uh, this is made at the moment with some of, of our colleagues. Um, I will, I think I will pass on this. I will, I just want to show that uh, with SDO, we are able to look at um, the evolution of the filaments. Um, and what we think we are seeing is actually um, the fact that the filament starts with an early rise and suddenly gets ejected. And what we think is happening is um, when we looked at the HMI data, we saw some um, emergence of a, of a nice bipole that we looked at as well with feed data, although at the moment the feed data is still being calibrated, we still don't have the final results, but a quick look at the magnetic field as well as continuum data really showed us this nice bipole emerging, and we're seeing that this bipole really plays a role in detaching this, this uh, flux rope and pushing it uh, to the verge of, um, uh, of in instability. So this is a, a quick look, it's very preliminary, uh, but this is the kind of, of data that we can have. And again, it's really nice to see how we can do a stereoscopically um, uh, detections of here magnetic field with HMI. We also have SOT on Hinoday as well as uh, phi on solar orbiter. Um, I will just want to show something. I will, uh, this is just the last kind of cherry on the cake that, that we found was that during that time, during the flare, uh, Hinode ice, so uh, the spectrum meter on, on, on the Hinode mission went into flare watch. So it started looking at the, the region and went into a, a sit and stare observation. And we have um, really, really nice uh, observations of different lines, um, iron 24, iron 12, helium 2, and they all show really nice um, uh, Doppler shifts. Um, that is being analyzed at the moment, and we found uh, blue shifts that were reaching up to 500 kilometers per second. Um, and what we think, uh, and again, this is a bit video that is not working, but the slits um, is perpendicular to, I hope you can see my mouse, you can see it on my screen, so I, I think you can all see it, but what we're catching is basically the, the legs of the, of the filament, uh, what you see here on the, on the left side with the AIA, data and what we think we're seeing is the swirling motion of the filament material inside the legs that are expanding and at the same time what is nice is that we actually also have the spice data um, seen from an ops, uh, uh, another point of view uh, this is an intensity map of the different ions that we have uh, and we also have the Doppler shifts. Um, so the, I find that the Dopplers are really, really nice. We are also uh, measuring up to 400 kilometers per second in terms of blue shifts, which corresponds you know, to what we've seen uh, with you know, the eyes. And in a way, it's kind of the first time that we, um, just gonna shift to this conclusion, it's really the first time that we do a spectroscopic observations in stereoscopy uh, in a way um, and what we found that the findings uh, really correspond to the expectations that we have uh, from uh, the 3D models that we have of, of our active players. Um, so this is just a kind of a taster. Um, again, this is in, in this is almost to be submitted, but still in preparation, final preparation. So uh, I guess it's good that I'm not dwelling on, on that too much at the moment. Um, I just want to give some perspective. I think right now we've got really nice instruments on different spacecraft that allows us to look at different point of views of flares, SCP events. This event uh, also gave, as I said uh, earlier, really nice widespread SCP events. We have a CME that is associated to it that was also detected by Solar Orbiter. Um, and I think that's a, a, you know, we're in in a, in in an era where we're or an age or an epoch, if I may say, where we can really look at events in, from different perspectives and really constrain the models that, that we have. Um, 
at the moment, I just want to say that we have um, uh, another exercise of a long-term active region watch. We have more than 14 days of observations um, that we coordinated with ground-based uh, telescopes. And um, I prepared a page on the um, the solar orbiter uh, wiki uh, that you can you can have a look um, if you want, where we're looking at this target, the one that is indicated with the, the green arrow. And uh, it's, a, it's a nice active region, although there are no sunspots really, um, but it shows really how we can now coordinate with different um, observers and try to really put together the instruments that we have in order to understand these uh, origins of, of space weather. Um, so I will stop here. Um, I hope I left enough time for a few questions if you have any, um, but I hope I gave you a, a taste of what's yet to come um, and to get you excited about the missions that we have. Thank you very much, Mijo. It was really nice presentation, really Thank interesting. You. Uh, and uh, really nice for me to see the last results. Uh, there are two questions so far. Uh, yeah. One is for, from Aline. It's in the chat. Nevertheless, I will read it. Okay. How can we determine intensity from images as you showed around slide uh, 68, 69? And how we can differentiate the regions of filaments from other parameters like Corona? Uh, okay, so 65, I think it was around here, I guess. So, um, so I, I, so the, the intensity is given directly from, uh, from, from the data itself. So, um, maybe the, the question is, how, how do we, if I understand well, how do we understand the different regions that we see? Um, and wh what I will say is that um, the, you can see that we have different structures that are emitting or absorbing. And these are related to what is the composition of the plasma that we have, what's the, so what's the density of the plasma, how hot the plasma is. And um, and also the composition in terms of what what are the um, the ions that, that are uh, within the plasma of, of that that structure. So in this case, I I think that's the one that Adin was referring to. Uh, we can see some really bright loops here. So we I, I talked about overlying arcades in the sense that these are coronal loops. Um, they are they seem to be uh, so they are heated at least to the point that we see them in here 174 angstrom, um, so that give us at least a range of temperature that we have, um, and we also see some uh, dark uh, material underneath. And the reason why I can say that this is a filament is really by looking at um, difference. If I go back in. Um, I go back here, um, I've got this 304, so this is not a really clear image because normally it's supposed to be a movie or maybe if I go back here. Um, I've got um, 304 image, I also have H alpha, uh, I also know what's the, um, uh, and, and also what is the, uh, the, the, the shape of it, so it's kind of a very typical filament-like structure. Um, so I hope I, I answered if the question was really how, how we differentiate things. Um, it, 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 it's okay, I'll leave me with the... And there, there's another, thank you. thank you, thank you, Mijo. There's another question from Jorge. Yeah. Uh, thank, thank you, excellent presentation. My question is, what is in your mind limiting the forecasting of the solar wind and SEP properties at 1IU? lack of observation, lack of knowledge of the physics, or lack of better models alone above, uh, how to get better results? Uh, well, I say it's it's all all of it all of the above, and it's I mean it's an easy answer to say that, but the reason is uh, is uh, I think multiple in the sense that first of all, um, in in order to uh, well, I, I would say we're not too bad at, at understanding where things would come from. So if we have an active region, we kind of know that this is generally the source of where we would have flaring activity. Okay, we would not have flaring activity if we have a coronal hole. If we have a coronal hole, however, we know that we have fast solar wind. Now, if the question is, can we exactly pinpoint when we have um, 
uh, what's the, the the speed of the solar wind and when it will reach 1 AU. I don't think we are there yet, but we do have models that allow us to do connected connection. And we're actually using these tools for the solar orbiter mission when we try to do connection in advance. So we're saying, OK, we're pointing at this region of the sun. We know this is the boundary of an active region, so we might have a transition between slow solar wind and fast solar wind, or we are pointing our telescope uh, at the center of a corner hole, and we know that uh, approximately the connectivity, uh, uh, so the, the, the time range um, for this fast solar wind to arrive at the, at the spacecraft. Um, so the, the question is, there are a lot, a lot of aspects. There's also the flaring aspect. We, we don't know right now how to predict exactly when a, a flare is going to occur. However, we can still see how an active region is, is developing. If we see a really complex um, active region with uh, strong magnetic fields and, and we know the complexity is increasing, we have a higher chance of, get, of having a flare. But now to say we're going to have a flare right now, at that point, and it's going to emit that you know range of particle that energy for particles. I think we're not there yet. So for that, we need to understand more. This, this, is, this is analytical knowledge as well, uh, and not just models. I would say. And so, how to get better results? I would say, well, continue what we're doing, continue the research that we are doing. I, I, and and I, I hope I conveyed with this presentation that there are really different aspects. There's the modeling aspect, of course. There's also the observational aspects. So how to constrain with different views, of course, um, and uh, and and we need to push forward all, all these all these fronts. So thank you, thank you again. And there's another question from Blue Solar. What is the usual time lapse between the when a solar fire occurs and when the effects are detected by ground, and or in C2 instrument on the Earth? Is the time lapse different from CME events? Yes. Yes. Well, yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. So um, the uh, so it depends. So for a solar flare. So as I said, as I said earlier, um, maybe if I go back. Uh, well, I think it's, it was really at the beginning of the presentation. When we have a solar flare, um, there are different um, different aspect of a solar flare. So when we look at the light that is emitted, so in terms of radiation, this is. Uh, you know, within eight minutes, or well, uh, it takes eight minutes uh, for us to really see the light that comes from from this flaring flaring region. So it's almost instantaneous, I would say. Um, in terms of high energy particles, that would be kind of similar. Although this also depends on what is the path of propagation of those uh, particles of so those SAPs. And this is a more tricky question to answer because. It's not because you have a flare that you will necessarily detect something on Earth or at 1 AU or wherever, because it really depends on where um, are you connected and whether the path of these particles is coming towards you or not. And in terms of time, that also depends. Sometimes you have a flare region that is not really connected to where you are as an observer, but you will eventually see the SCPs maybe with you know three minute delay to if you were on the pass, just because of the exp uh, the extension, the longitudinal extension that is provided by a shock, for example. Uh, and then the uh, and and then in terms of CMEs, CMEs they take much longer than part of energy particles. They can take a few hours for the fastest one to a few days to arrive, um, and and this is felt much later uh, in time. Um, so so we kind of know roughly when they arrive. We know roughly the, the timing, but then from one event to another one, there are a lot of things that can happen. A CME can be ejected, and then another one that will accelerate the first one, so that your CME um, propagation models that you have that allows you to uh, to say, oh, this event will arrive at Earth at this time, will actually fail because there were other things that happen or deflection or. Um, so, yeah, I don't know whether I'm, I'm, I'm answering, you know, in a positive way in the sense that I feel that we're we're making progress, but I think from one case to another one, it's very difficult to get to the, you know, minute to the exact hour when things are going to arrive. Yeah, yeah thank you, thank you uh, for the explanation. There's another question from Oladayo. Thank you for the presentation. Please, what is the threshold for high speed solar wind speed and for the slow moving solar wind? 
Mm. Uh, it's a really good question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I would say that at, at one AU we made a distinction. Uh, maybe there are some experts in in the virtual room that that will uh, complement my my answer. But I would say generally the slow solar wind is around four hundred kilometer per second, and the fast one is around six hundred um, kilometer per second. But what's interesting is that there are studies now that are looking at closer to the sun. And the distinction is actually not that clear. When you're closer to the sun, you see a, um, a transition between what we used to call slow solar wind to fast solar wind that is actually not that clear. It's not just a, a, a um, bimodal distribution. Um, so that's kind of interesting. There is a, a process that really starts to make it more uh, bimodal at one year than it is next to the, earth, uh, to the sun. Yeah. Depends highly on the on the place of the in between you yes. are looking where you are looking. Thank you. Uh, Aline also says that thank you for the answer before. And in addition, is it possible to know the source of solar uh, space weather, solar wind weather? I think it comes um, it comes due to CME or coral holes, especially in high solar activity period. Um, so yeah, it's it. I mean, again, this is kind of a uh, it's, it's it's tricky to answer in the sense that um, what we see is we do have you know um, we do have observations of the origins of, of of such events. So with coronagraphs such as LASCO, for example, we monitor constantly the, the sun and we see the CMEs that are um, erupting. Uh, in AIA 193, I, I would say that's the you know what major passband in order to look at coronal holes. So we also see whether we have a coronal holes or not. Um, and and so whenever there is no CME, but you know that is a coronal hole, it's quite easy to say, well, the source of the high speed stream that we saw uh, and we complemented with in situ observations, they also have different uh, signatures. So uh, coronal holes um, or, you know, they have a higher beta than, than CMEs, for example. CMEs, they tend to, well, they have different signatures. I, I won't go too much into detail right now. Um, so we kind of, we can separate them normally. The problem is when, as you said, we come into high solar activity period and then we have both of them or we have uh, several CMEs happening and then a coronal hole, then it can be mixed. And there are people who really are studying this kind of things. They're studying the interaction between coronal holes, so uh, fast fast um, solar wind with CMEs, uh, CME, CME interactions. And, and so it becomes a bit more of a mess. So even though you can see the source, it doesn't mean that what you get um, in at one AU, for example, is necessarily what you guessed just by looking at the sun. Um, so I would say high solar activity period much more difficult than um, uh, low act solar activity when it's more easy to decorrelate. But, yeah. Thank you very much, Miho. We can have one last question. Um, I, I don't know if there's someone that want to ask something. Or you can raise your hand also. OK. Another question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Miho, for, for being here, for accepting our invitation. It was thank really, you so much. It was a really nice presentation and very clear one. Uh, and uh, again, uh, thank you very much, and for everybody, you know this 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 uh, talk will be on in, a, in the UNOSA YouTube channel sooner. So thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all. <laughs>